Welcome to Vintage Hollywood Archive. For all the art and positivity that Redford has undoubtedly unleashed into the world, he's endured a shocking amount of hardships, misfortune, death, dysfunction, calamity, and tragedy. Do you know all about the worst, lowest, and most trying moments in the long life, in the long life and career of Robert Redford? Why Robert Redford credits a murderer for saving his life? Make sure to watch the video until the end. And if you're new here, don't forget to join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. There is a good chance that you know Robert Redford from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Or perhaps you are just a bit younger and you are familiar with him from Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Whatever the case, Robert Redford has long been known as one of Hollywood's most accomplished stars. No matter what he did, the actor has always been much more than just an actor. Producing and directing classics, as well as launching the careers of many independent filmmakers, he has been a critical and commercial success. But do you have any idea how much pain he had to endure before reaching that level of success? And how he used his hardships to mold himself into an ideal personality? Keep watching this video to learn all about the notoriously private Robert Redford. The actor was born in Santa Monica, California. Originally, his father was a milkman, but later he worked as an oil company accountant. While his mom was a homemaker. But there was something more harrowing to being born to a middle class family. He was diagnosed with a devastating disease, polio. Yes. It was almost entirely eradicated in the 1950s with a vaccine, but don't forget that Redford grew up in the 1930s and 1940s when polio remained widespread. It wasn't an iron lung case. It was a case of mild polio, but it was severe enough to put him in bed for two weeks. Escaping major lasting damage from polio, Redford would pay tribute to Jonas Salk, developer of the polio vaccine, as a co-director of Cathedrals of Culture, a documentary about the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Not long after he recovered from a childhood bout of polio, a very young Robert Redford dealt with a tremendous family tragedy, the effects of which would be felt for years and end an even more untimely death. When Redford was 10 years old, the actor's mother, Martha Redford, gave birth to twin girls. Her doctor warned against the pregnancy. Robert Redford's birth had been particularly medically troublesome. Sadly, Redford's sister died almost immediately after birth. Martha Redford developed a blood disorder during the chaotic, dramatic medical episode, but she remained a wonderful woman to Redford. She definitely influenced the future star, sharing both her love of films and books with him, while also role-playing with him and teaching him how to draw. Sadly, Redford's time with his mother was cut short. Her blood disorder would remain a permanent, nagging condition until it led to a hemorrhage and her death in 1955, a year after he graduated high school. During a chat with NPR, the Sting actor mentioned that his family wasn't exactly good at dealing with loss. I come from a dark family from Ireland and Scotland, he explained, adding, they didn't talk much, they didn't complain much, they didn't ask for anything. They bore the brunt of whatever came their way. He recalled that even when he lost his sisters, no one talked about the tragedy at home. When one thinks of Robert Redford, the man who has played countless charming and confident roles on television, it's hard to believe he was struggling to fit in when he was a child. It was anything but easy for him to grow up with his peers. He had a freckled face and red hair with cowlicks that people laughed at. In his teens, the future star was still bullied since he was a late bloomer, far from the rugged heartthrob he'd later become. Robert Redford, the biography, says a local gang called the Patchucks picked on him constantly, which led to one scary rooftop incident. Redford recalled how the gang dared him to jump from the roof to prove he was a man, which he almost died doing. Redford was a bit older when things changed. According to his biography, the actor started his own gang, the Barons, to do illegal things like stealing and breaking into houses. The road to success wasn't always smooth for Robert Redford. 
His employers fired him repeatedly when he was in high school because he failed at everything. Thanks to his natural athletic ability, Redford got a basketball scholarship to the University of Colorado. But guess what? After just one year of school, he dropped out because he wasn't one to follow the rules. What's the solution? A dream of becoming an artist led him to Europe. In France, then in Italy, time went by and his hardships only increased. He hitchhiked around the country and painted in the streets to make ends meet. It's obvious that Redford wasn't flourishing in wealth, and he says he once slept in cow manure to stay warm. There are a lot of stories about actors being paid weirdly or not at all for their first gigs. In Redford's case, his first professional acting gig was on a game show. He didn't get the $75 acting fee he was supposed to get, but he got a fishing rod instead. Can you believe that? We wonder if this is what inspired him to direct A River Runs Through It several years later. Well, in the same year he returned from Europe and got married to Lola Van Wagenen. The couple eloped and then quickly moved to New York, where Redford studied at the Pratt Institute before being cast in a play. The actor said the couple lived on his wife's $55 a week bank job and was struggling financially. Eventually, Van Wagenen had to stop working when she found out she was pregnant and they had nothing to fall back on. But the series of misfortunes didn't stop there. Slightly more than a decade after grieving the immediate death of his newborn twin siblings, Robert Redford once more dealt with the tragic loss of an infant. This time, it was his own child, his first offspring. That was a tough hit. Scott Redford died a sudden infant death syndrome at just over two and a half months old in 1959. Declining to speak about the event much over the years, Redford instead quietly raised funds to research into the cause of SIDS. After this tragic event, it didn't take Redford long to land his first Broadway role in 1959 in a comedy called Tall Story. The part had just one line, but he got $82 a week. As Robert Redford's star power rose, he found steady work in the film industry at the beginning of the 1960s. As a married couple with two children and his wife Lola doing well, but something was off. He was unhappy, but why? He didn't know either, so Redford decided to take a solo road trip to get his head back on track, parking his car in Big Sur and walking 90 miles. It's in his biography that he recounts how he found Dietjen's Big Sur Inn and made friends with the owner. Over the course of a few days, they talked endlessly. Despite his volatile nature, Redford's new friend was a wise man. Redford turned out that his days spent with the innkeeper were just what he needed. You might be surprised to know that he was convicted of murder. Yes, Redford credited a murder for rekindling his thirst for life. He's been a Hollywood icon for 60 years, so he got a lot of other famous friends. He was particularly close to Natalie Wood, who he had met long before he got on the A-list. It's no secret that Redford was also close friends with Paul Newman, and the two had a great time joking with each other on the set of The Sting. Newman's best prank on Redford during the production involved the Porsches that both actors drove. Newman managed to steal Redford's car keys and hide Redford's Porsche in the process, giving the impression that the car had been stolen. It was also Paul Newman who helped Redford get the role in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which made him a household name. Redford not only played the Sundance Kid, but he also picked the location. After the actor got hired, he found out Hill wanted to film in Spain since it was cheaper than in America. In the end, it ended up being Utah since Radford took the director to his home state and explained why it was visually and historically significant. The Graduate, a classic movie about a young man who becomes involved with an older married woman, had Redford on the shortlist of candidates in the 1960s. The role was awarded to Dustin Hoffman rather than Redford, of course. It may be surprising to learn that Redford was unable to achieve the role because director Mike Nichols believed that it would not be realistic for someone like Redford to have difficulty getting a girl. Redford protested, but Nicholas asked him a simple question. Have you ever been rejected by a woman? 
This question confused Redford due to the fact that the answer was, of course, no. It is unusual to be considered too handsome for a role in Hollywood, but yes, this was the actual case here. Probably Redford's best and most successful movie was The Sting. Isn't it interesting that Redford himself didn't see the movie until 2004 out of all the people who saw it since 1973? Well, you shouldn't miss Redford in The Sting if you think Tom Cruise runs a lot in his movies. In this movie, Redford makes such a lot of hasty trips that he was reportedly concerned he wouldn't have time to do any real acting. At the end of the shoot, Redford got a special gift, a sculpture of the Roadrunner, a character from the Looney Tunes cartoon series. What a great present for Redford. We wish we could have seen his face when he got it. The Sting was Redford's only Oscar nomination in an acting category. All of his other Academy Award nominations were for directing. In fact, he became one of the first big stars to segue into directing, for which he won an Oscar in 1981 for Ordinary People. If you want to see how high Redford star was during his heyday, check out his role in A Bridge Too Far during World War II. For just two weeks' work, Redford allegedly made $2 million. When it came to stunts, Redford did all his own stunts for the Electric Horseman. He also went to the trouble of portraying his character right-handed, even though he's left-handed. In fact, he had to do this several times in his film career, including All Is Lost. In everything he did, he was fair. It is known that if stuntmen were employed with the production, he insisted that they continue to be paid, regardless of how many of his stunts he performed himself. After parenting three kids to adulthood across nearly three decades, Redford and Van Wagenen divorced in 1985, according to People. I got lost for a time, the actor said of post-marriage life. After failed flings with actor Sonia Braga and costume designer Kathy O'Rear, Redford met Billy Zagars, an artist about 20 years younger. They met in 1996 and married in 2009, after being together for over 20 years. He continued to be a great husband and then an amazing grandfather. Do you wonder how? The reason why Redford co-starred in Captain America The Winter Soldier is proof. Firstly, he rarely played villains and liked to go against the grain. The second reason for Redford's participation was that he wanted to appear in a Marvel film for his grandchildren, who are allegedly Marvel fans. What an amazing grandpa, right? Robert Redford announced in 2016 that he would stop acting after two more films in an interview with his grandson for Walker. David Lowry, the old man in the gun, ended up being Redford's final flick, a fitting watch for a legend like Redford. We can put it, a love letter to a cinematic legend, and after seeing Redford's charisma, it's hard to disagree. As reported by Time, The Old Man in the Gun is based on a true story, or at least most of it is. Redford played Forrest Tucker, a 70-year-old who escaped from Sam Quentin State Prison. Then he goes back to robbing banks like he's always done. The main thing that makes Tucker stand out from other criminals is that he has a gentlemanly charm that even his hostages can't resist. As much as anything, Redford was attracted to the film because of its main character. It's not like all the other outlaws I've played against the law, he joked in an HFPA interview. Tucker is just having a good time. He's not against anything. Variety reported that he hopes the movie will make people smile. It's the perfect way to remember an icon in Hollywood. But in addition to his films, we have indeed many other reasons to remember Redford. One of those many reasons is how he managed to become a great human for other human beings as well as for nature. The love for the world's natural beauty continues to inspire Redford long after his mother took him to the Navajo reservations in Arizona in Yosemite as a child. He became an environmentalist, and he brings that ideology to his movies. It was necessary to strip saplings and trees of their leaves during three days of the Condor production. Redford personally ensured that the plants were not permanently damaged during the process. Whether it was about nature or the workplace environment, he has always been a man who believes in making a positive change. Yet no matter how we rail against the status quo, most of us are reluctant to take action in the workplace. Don't you think so?
After all, sticking one's neck out only invites an ax. Dealing with a choice between our values and our job, most of us either surrender ourselves to the situation or leave. Yet there is a third way. Make a difference to inspire change at work. Robert Redford is one of those very people who brought that successful change. Over the past 20 years or so, he has led a behind-the-scenes effort to change the movie industry. In 1981, shortly after he won a directorial Oscar for Ordinary People, Redford founded the Sundance Institute, an artist's community in the mountains of Utah. Sundance was a quietly radical experiment in change. He originally envisioned Sundance as a haven for bubbling writers and directors with promising ideas in their heads and little more than lint in their pockets. Through the years, Sundance has proved such a successful incubator of independent films that it has become one of the most influential forces in Hollywood. Redford's unique ability to bring a change makes him stand out from the rest of the Hollywood stars. Even after surviving a lot of tragedies in life that were meant to break him, he remained an on-screen and off-screen hero. Can you ever deny that the way he managed to become a role model for us is commendable? Of course not right? Share your thoughts in the comments. It may be that Robert Redford's life was full of tragedies, but not his love life. Why Patricia Neal and Gary Cooper had the most tragic love story. Watch this video.